if you want us to record it, it'll work. So, but it worked. So I guess he wants us to record it. So, all right, we good. All right, good deal. Good deal. Man, today's a good day. And I can see it's, it's not, you know, I, I knew it looked dark in here earlier. I was like, man, it looks dark in here, but all right, good deal. Good deal. Let me get a drink of water. All right. So I got something I run across that I'd I like to share with you guys. Is I thought was pretty interesting. I, I never really knew this, but we'll see if you guys did too. So in 1867, a Swedish chemist named Alfred Nobel awoke one morning to read his own obituary in the local paper. Could you imagine that? You wake up and here's your obituary in the paper. Now, if you want to know what people really think about you, read your obituary, right? It says, Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite, of all things, the inventor of dynamite, who died yesterday, devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than ever before. And because of this, he died a very rich man. So could you imagine if you read that as your obituary? Wow. Good thing for Alfred was, actually it was Alfred's older brother who had died. A newspaper reporter had made a mistake. But the account had a profound effect on Alfred. It would me too to be known as the man that devised something to kill millions of people. So what did he do? He... He decided he, went, he wanted to be known for something other than developing a means to kill people efficiently and amassing a fortune in the process. So Nobel initiated something we might know of today. He initiated the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, an award for scientists and writers who foster peace. Nobel said every man ought to have the chance to correct his epitaph in midstream and write a new one. I never knew that. Alfred Nobel's motivation to start the Nobel Prize was he didn't want to, his legacy to be for creating something of mass destruction. I don't blame him. I wouldn't either. But you know, we all have different motivations in life, right? Some good, some bad. Well, not last week, the week before last, the last sermon, we talked about motivations, right? More specifically, what motivated us to, to give, to do charitable deeds, what motivates us to help others. Now, last, and, sorry, not last week, two weeks ago, we also talked about a word that we hear a lot of nowadays, but it was also used in the Bible, the word hypocrite which I guarantee is the number one thing the unchurched don't like about church is hypocrites. Now, if we want to be a hypocrite, then, then we need to sound a trumpet, as Jesus said, every time we do a charitable deed. Do -do 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 -do. Look what I did. Put it on the, the, the board out here on the, the, the sign by the road. We're going to list out who gave what and did what and who did this, you know. Like we had the, the, the analogy of Ric Flair, you know, woo, look what I did, you know. No, if you want to be a hypocrite, that's what you do. But we need to make sure, we, you know, we don't, we, if you want to be a hypocrite, tell everybody what we did. Make sure and spread that person's business everywhere. You know, here's what I helped them do. I picked Johnny up out of jail. He, he had a DWI, you know, and. You know, Will's got a gambling problem again, but I bailed him out. You know, that's a hypocrite. That's how you handle doing charitable deeds. Luckily for us, we don't want to be like that, right? So Jesus said, if we want to be a follower of Jesus, more commonly known as a Christian nowadays, then we need to keep our charitable deeds to ourselves, right? We don't do them for recognition. We, we, we do them to bless people and to be an ambassador of Christ. Jesus himself tells us, if we do these, our Father who sees our deeds will reward us openly. 
This is a right, there is a right and a wrong way to do charitable deeds. We should never go the way of the hypocrite. But that was two weeks, that was a message from two weeks ago. Now Jesus is going, he's going to give us a, a right and wrong way to do something else. If y'all just start with us, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount. We've been going through this for a while. But now Jesus, he's going to give us a right and a wrong way to do something else. And he's going to let us, let us figure out what motivates us to do this. The title of today's message is Our Motivation Prayer. If you will, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. You know, here a while back I started, and um, while you guys are, are look, flipping through your Bible, you know, I started, I started in a, uh, uh, a running group on Saturday mornings. I, I've never run in a group. I always run by myself. I like to run for people that don't know. Um, but, you know, you start running with people in a group, for an hour or two, there's times for a lot of conversations to come up. You know, you don't just sit there and quiet the whole time. There's, people start talking. You start hearing about people's problems or struggles or what's going good and what's not going good. You know, you can only imagine for an hour to two hours, you know. But in, in doing this, you know, and if you, people you know and you start to trust them, and then, and then uh, there's kind of a, uh, intimacy forms, you know, not, not romantic, but friendship, you know, the, they start telling you things because they trust you, right? Well, this is how prayer should be for us, right? It should be an intimate time between you and God, a time to talk to each other, you and God to communicate. Think about it. You're talking to the creator of the universe one on one. And Jesus gives us a right way and a wrong way to do it. So let's go ahead and get it out of the way. Let's see how the hypocrites do it. How do the hypocrites do it? Matthew 6, 5. Jesus says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. The sole purpose of our prayers is not to be seen by others. We don't pray to impress people. Let's remember what the Greek definition of hypocrite was. There was a specific word that translated to hypocrite in the Greek vocabulary. It was used in theater to describe a person that was pretending to be somebody else. They were, as we might call them, an actor. So they were pretending to be something they actually were not. And so Jesus says, these are hypocrites. As Jesus says, the hypocrites called them, they were trying to act like they were great men of God by praying in front of everybody with the sole purpose of impressing them. You know, when I was, I had a point in my life where my intelligence was right there at Alfred Einstein level. It was probably around fourth or fifth grade, you know. I don't know how are you, 11, 12, 10 years old, something like that. And I had a buddy of mine all through elementary school and up to about seventh grade. He was my best buddy. His name was Scott. Uh, Scott. And... Anyways, he lived around the corner. It was a good ways, you know, but he lived within a bike riding distance, you know. You know, his road was, a little, was just a road and a cul-de-sac, you know. Well, anyways, there was this, this, um, this girl there that, that I liked, you know. So I'm, you know, like, I mean, like any 11 or 12-year-old boy, I'm trying to impress her, right? So I would ride my bike. I'd try and do a wheelie in front of her house, you know, and. And that didn't work. So then I would go really fast and skid the tires, you know, in a circle. And that wasn't doing no good. So then we built a bike ramp, right? And I'd ramp over the bike ramp, and she's still not impressed, right? So then I'd come up, and I'm like, okay, I've, I've got it. I've got it, Scott. So, so I rode my bike. It kind of went downhill a little bit. 
and I got going really fast. And, you know, the roads had a little curb, and I hit it on my bike and, and then acted like I ramped and flew off and, oh, you know, fell on the ground. I'm kind of looking like maybe she'll come over here and check on me, you know. And she said, what are you doing, you know? But she was not impressed at all, you know. But the whole purpose of all of those bicycle tricks was to impress her. It didn't work, but I thought I was going to impress her with it, right? But this is what the hypocrites, as Jesus was called them, were doing. The Jews stopped. They stopped and prayed at 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. Wherever you at, you stopped and you prayed. We've heard about Daniel, right? He would stop and he, he prayed, but he was praying in his room in private, right? But these guys are stopping and praying. They're like, whoa, I better slow down. We got like three minutes till nine. And I won't be on this busy intersection right here where everybody in the market. They wanted to stop and be in front of everybody when they prayed. Or they want to stop. Hey, we're in the front entrance of the synagogue. Oh, I got to stop and pray. Or they're going to be at wherever, as long as there's a crowd of people, they made sure they were there between 9, noon, and 3 p.m. So everybody would see what they looked like praying. So the question is, why would they do this? Why would they do this? You know, the Pharisees and scribes, they, they enjoyed the power they had. We have to remember, at this time, God was silent for almost 400 years. No prophets, no Holy Spirit, there's no voice from God. All they had was the law. And who interprets the law than Pharisees? There was nothing until John the Baptist. So what happens is the Pharisees, they're the great interpreters of the law, right? So they added their own twist to the law. They, they would make it comfortable for them and give them more power. And, and they would do all this stuff. So they had this great power they enjoyed. And they wanted people to be in awe of them. Whoa, look at those guys. You know, they wanted people to bow to them and, and, and be in awe to them. They enjoyed this power that they yielded. It's human nature. And they would use great big words to try and impress people. They, they wanted people to say, look how great and gifted this man of God is. Now if I ever stand up here and pray and, and, and use words like, you know, hence and there forth and, and go forth, Lord, and cascade your spirit and transcend it on us. No, I, I don't speak that way. I would just be trying to impress you guys. I don't even know what half those words mean. <laughs> even though, you know, I don't mean, I don't know what half of them mean. If I ever speak like that, throw something at me. Because that's not me. It would only be to impress you guys. What they were really doing, what these Pharisees, what these people were really doing is they were taking this intimate act, this intimate act of praying to the creator of the universe and they were turning it into a circus. This is not what we want to do. Let's just skip that part. We don't want to do this. We should never do this. We should never pray to us to impress other people. Jesus says they had their reward. It's them two or three people that are in awe of what they did. That's their reward. But looking for us, Jesus gives, a, gives us a correct way to pray. Look at verse 6. He says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. I love these words. But you, when you pray, that's you, 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 and you. All of us are supposed to pray. This is something we need to do every day. If you want to get your day off to a good start, begin it with prayer. 
Pray to God, thanking him for, for that, the breath in your air, breath in your lungs. Thank him for the place you live. Thank him for whatever. Begin your day by thanking God in prayer and see what happens. You know, I, I love to listen to Lauren's prayer before we eat. One thing we do no matter what is pray in our food. And she's not here, so I can say this. But, and I make her pray when we're in public. All right, do the blessing. And she'll say, thank you, God, for this food to give us strength to worship you another day. She come up that with her own. It wasn't nothing that's different. I had the same thing I say, but this was her own prayer. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the strength to worship you another day. Now, next week, we're going to go into the model prayer, the Lord's prayer, but not today. But here Jesus is telling us to go somewhere private and pray to God. Yes, it's okay to pray in public, but not for the intentions of impressing people. Psalms 145, 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth. You want to grow close to God, then pray to him. Begin your day with prayer, end your day with prayer. I like the words of Jeremiah in, in chapter 33. He says, God says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Call on God through prayer. Call on God through prayer. Let him know what you're struggling with, what you need help with. Lord, I need some help. Lord, I don't know what to do. Call on him and he will show you great and mighty things. Here's a tip. It will usually be something out of left field. He will answer you with something out of left field you were not expecting. And you, whoa, I wasn't seeing this coming. And it's going to be ten times better than what you were asking for. Amen. Here's one of the most important things, though. Here's one of the most important things. When you call on God, do it without any doubt. If you're doubting, don't, don't even waste your time. Call on God through faith without any doubt. James even speaks on this. He says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. If you ever feel like you're getting tossed around in life, like a pinball machine, shot over here, shot over here, over here, bounced over here, and you just feel like you've been in a fight with Mike Tyson, stop doubting God. There is nothing more powerful than a prayer without any doubt in it. If you do this in private and not for show, if you pray to God in private and you don't do it to show or impress a girl or, or whatever, and you do it through faith with no doubt, Jesus says, then your Father who sees everything will reward you. Now Jesus gives us another don't. You know, one thing you can say, he, he, you can't say, well, you didn't tell me so. You know, because Jesus covers all, all of it. He gives us another don't right here. Do not do this. Verse 7. And when you pray, once again, here we go. When you pray, it's not an option. You are supposed to pray as a Christian. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as, a, as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not use vain repetitions. The NIV translates, translated as, do not keep on babbling. The English Standard Version says, do not heap up empty phrases. So do not keep babbling empty phrases. Don't keep repeating meaningless words. It does no good. Do not be like a heathen. 
Now, I used to hear this word a lot when I was in my Albert Einstein stage because my sister used to always pester me and call me a heathen when I was 12 years old. <laughs> but what is a heathen? It's an uncultured person, an uncivilized person, a strange person, or in this context, a person with no religion. When I hear the word heathen, I think of a wild animal or, or the barbarians you would see on, on the movies, right? But think of the pagans we hear about in the Bible. This is heathens. In the NIV translation, Jesus says, Do not keep on babbling like the pagans do. You know, we were studying, we've been studying. We're in 2 Kings, we were in 1 Kings. And we had in the book of 1 Kings in the Bible, there was a story of the showdown between Elijah and the what was it, 450 prophets of Baal. Cool story. We're going to see which God was greater. Which God is greater? So what did they do? Elijah told them, Let you go first. You call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of, of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, that is the true God. So he said, you guys go first. There's 450 of them. Y'all, you guys go first. So it says, so they took the bull, which was given them, and they prepared it. And what did they do? They had it up there on the sacrifice. And they called on the name of, of Baal from morning until noon. Morning until noon. Here's what they're saying. O oh, Baal, hear us. O oh, Baal, hear us. But you know what? There was no voice. No one answered. Then what did they do? They leaped around the fire. They leaped around the altar, which they had made. Look, probably looked silly. They're dancing and all this. Four to six hours and they're repeating the words, O oh, Baal, hear us. 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 Nothing happened. For four to six hours, they repeated these meaningless words. You know, there's a, there's a book in the Bible called, a, a, oh, I'm going to butcher this name, Ecclesiastes. It's the book of wisdom. Book of wisdom. Chapter 5, verse 3, I love it. It says, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. A fool's voice is known by his many words. Don't be a fool. Don't sound foolish when you're praying. Now Jesus has one more verse for us. Matthew 6, 8. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Therefore, do not be like them. Don't be like the pagans. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be like the hypocrites. Do not dance around like the fire, repeating the same verse for four to six hours. Don't keep repeating the same thing over and over, hoping it will come true. How did your kids do it when they're little? Like, oh, please, 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 please. You know, two hours later, it ain't happening. You can stop. Don't stand on the corner of the street in front of everybody and use really big words in your prayers with the sole purpose of impressing people. We might even in the back of our mind do it, think we're impressing God. Our prayer is going to be more powerful to God if we use these words we don't even know what they mean. Jesus says right here, therefore do not be like them. Don't take this intimate privilege that Jesus, he paid the price for us so we could talk directly to God. Think about it. Don't take it and turn it into a circus. Don't take it and make yourself look and sound like a fool. Why is there no need for us to do any of this? It says, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. 
for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. I have a note I wrote in my Bible beside this verse that says, if we could only realize this. We don't have to do any of the foolish things for our prayers to be heard. We just need to have faith and pray without any doubt, any doubt in for God to hear our prayers. It says, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. If we could only realize this. You know, do we ever feel like we have the, the weight of the world on our shoulders? I'm in the same boat as Shelly sometimes. I'm ready to throw my hands up. I'm tired of my job. I'm, I'm a pastor, but I'm, I'm human too, you know? Do we ever feel like, no, it's not the preaching job, the, I mean the pastor job, it's the secular job, the worldly job, do we ever feel like we had the weight of the world on our shoulders at times? Do we, do we ever just feel beat down from living in the world we live in? It's full of crazy people. No morals, no respect anymore. Do we ever get beat down by living in this world? How about just trying to pay the bills? Man, I bought some lunch meat the other day. It's $12 a pound. A price of a new vehicle has gone up 35%. Cost of housing has gone up almost 40% in the last three years. These are crazy numbers. It, you know, if you think about it, there, there is more distractions in this world than there ever has been. The world is more demanding now than it ever has been. In the last 25 years, there is more ways of people to get a hold of you than there ever has been. People will call you, text you, email you, direct message you, reach out through social media, all this stuff, you know, blah, 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 blah. And they want an answer right then. You look at all of it. What, what do you mean, what color is my car? You know, it's, it's nothing important. But people think you got to answer them right then. It's the world we live in. It's what the world has evolved to. Something else that has happened is, is the devil has more ways to distract you. He has more ways to tempt you than ever before. And it's all in a little thing called a cell phone. I think, I think it's tougher now than it ever has been in the modern world. I'd like to close this out with a verse today and a thought. Something to take home. Something to arm yourself with when you go out into this world. If you've got your Bibles, if you're in your Bibles, flip to the very back of the book of Matthew. If you're already in Matthew, flip to the very back of it. Now I know I'm preaching to, to people that know way more about the Bible than me. And we know the very back of Matthew is the Great Commission, right? Jesus says, go make disciples, spread the good news, spread God's word. Did you know yesterday, Brother Bob said something that, that as Christians, we're the minority now. I never really thought about that. I mean, if you kind of, yeah, I can kind of see it. But as Christians, we are the minority in this country now. This country was founded on Christian values. And now we are the minority. I mean, do you ever feel like we're losing? Or, or, or the devil's having a free reign in this country? Like I said, look how much the morals have slipped and how much evil is in this world. We all should know, we, we all should know the devil. He's going to get busier. The closer to the end times, he's going to get busier because he knows he's running out of time. But I'm going to leave you, I'm going to arm you with a verse to take home, to, to, to go out and face this world. Every morning, I want you guys to read it. Jesus gives us a great commission, great words. Go out and spread the good news. Share the gospel with everybody. This is what he's telling us to do. 
Right here, Matthew 28, 18. He says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, I love this. I have read this many times. I'm skipping right over this. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. First thing I want everybody to do is circle the word all. All authority has been given to Jesus in heaven and on earth. He doesn't share any of it. It, it doesn't go 50, 50, 50 Jesus, 50 devil, uh, 70, 30, 60, 40. None of it. Because all, all, all authority has begin, been given to Jesus in heaven and on earth. If you feel like you're, you're, you're just beat down and attacked by the enemy, call on the name of Jesus and the devil will flee. Why? Because he has all authority on earth and in heaven. If you ever speak the word, I speak these words quite often. I just don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. How am I going to figure this out? I don't know what to do. Stop doing it because you don't have to have it figured out. What you need to do instead is call on the name of Jesus. Call on Jesus for help. Why? Because he has all authority belongs to him. If you feel like the world where you're at, the world you're in, the situation you're in right now, if you feel like it has gone mad, just completely mad, call on Jesus. He will comfort you and he will protect you. Do it without doubting. Do it with full faith. Call on the name of Jesus because he's been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Nothing, nothing is too big for Jesus. Nothing. Why? Because all authority has been given to him. But for this to work, for this to work for you specifically, Jesus has to be your Lord and Savior. You have to call him, Jesus, I want you to be the center of my life. I want you to take over my life. You have to acknowledge that you are a sinner and you want to repent your ways. You need his saving grace. You have, you have to ask him to come into your life because you believe that he is a son. He is a son of God. And he died on the cross and he rose from the dead so you could be forgiven of your sins. Remember that all authority belongs to Jesus. Ask everybody, please stand.